Thanks, Phyllis, and um, hello to everyone. I'm glad to introduce the play date for this morning. Um, so the Center for HCI um, is uh, proud to, to uh, uh, present uh, a talk this morning by Farouk, and I, it's, it's pretty interesting. So um, in the last couple of years, we have had uh, Good four, morning, everyone. four or My five people Phyllis from Google, the uh, building construction area or I from the civil to uh, engineering area. I Sorry, I've got some um, audio this morning, going on I just here. Want to um, who have joined the Center for HCI. Uh, and you might wonder, like, what do buildings have to do with human computer interaction? So I think Farouk is going to talk about that today. But if you think about smart buildings that are infused with all sorts of technologies, and you think about the people that inhabit them, those form uh, a system, right? And that's a human computer interaction that's pretty interesting and that's different than what a lot of HCI researchers have, uh, have addressed. So Farouk, we're really happy to have you this morning. And uh, we've also got uh, Tian Ji uh, with him, one of his students who's gonna help out. So Farouk, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Phyllis, for the invitation. I appreciate it. So uh, very uh, nicely, uh, you know, described because this is what I wanted to continue discussing. And I tried to give a little bit of uh, human middle interaction uh, perspective and how we are looking at smart buildings, intelligent built environment in general, and human computer interaction. So the talk has has a bit of focus on each one of these components um, and. As pointed out, the title of the talk, uh, the talk is Human Building Interaction for uh, Smart Building Operations. I am Farouk Jezizade. I'm an assistant professor at the Civil Engineering Department. Um, been with Virginia Tech for uh, six years now. Uh, Tianji He is my PhD student who is uh, instrumental in part of the studies that we, I, I'm going to present in here. And of course, Wuyang Zhang, uh, who, is, uh, who was a former PhD student of mine, who is now the postdoc at uh, is, um has been instrumental in this process as well. So the way that I look at human building interaction, and of course, this is, this is uh, how the community looks at it, has a, a few pillars or a few dimensions into it. So one dimension is uh, human experience with the built environment, how people experience the built environment, how we can measure that, and of course, how we can make the built environment to, to be aware of the human in the, in the system, in the, in the environment. And once we learn these two, how we can adapt, how we can adapt to these conditions, either from the human side or building side, or how, or how we can cooperate between these two entities. So looking at these pillars, the research I'm going to present here has components from you know, built environment, human computer interaction and human sciences. So a lot of the applications that I present here has a focus on energy, has, has applications in energy domain. The reason is we are using a lot of energy in buildings. Uh, we, we use 74% uh, electricity for buildings, 40% of the total energy is used in buildings. And of course we have a lot of emissions. A lot of the agencies in the US have focused on uh, initiatives to reduce energy consumption. And of course, human centered design and operation have a significant role in these efforts. So in my research, I've looked at these uh, systems from two dimensions or two perspectives. One is just looking into intelligent environments or intelligent indoor environments. So these environments are specifically buildings or smaller units of operations. Uh, and in these cases, I look at adaptive human behavior. I look at uh, responsive and adaptive uh, indoor environments. And of course, uh, cooperation between humans and buildings. So, uh, oh, sorry, I... Thank you so much for <laughs> reminding. So apologies for uh, not sharing before. So I was talking about this, that part of the effort that we do in, in, in my lab uh, is focused on intelligent indoor environments. And these are the dimensions that we are looking at. And these dimensions are um, adaptation or, or human, human behavior adaptation, uh, responsive and adaptive indoor environments, and of course, cooperation between these entities. 
Uh, another dimension of the research that we do in the lab is, is HPI at scale. So we look at problems that are larger at the community level, city scale or neighborhood scale and how we could leverage human billing interaction for energy management specifically uh, for this talk. Uh, so the idea is to enable buildings to become intelligent units of operations for system level operations. And we could potentially use these, uh, this information for distributed operations. There is a, there is a plethora of research uh, publications and records on the distributed control of uh, power systems, uh, renewable energy systems. But in a lot of those cases, Human factors are very, um, you know, has have have low fidelity in the sense that they are usually represented by a temperature range, or for example, a percentage of how people perceive certain uh, aspects of the system. So, in what we are trying to do, we are trying to basically quantify and measure and integrate the nuances of human behavior and how individuals think about these systems. As I mentioned, I'm not going to, to, to talk about this aspect. I'm focusing on the intelligent indoor environments. Um, and here's the reason. Here, uh, this, this is an interesting uh, survey results from a 2001 survey from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab on a human activity pattern survey. This, this, the main purpose of the survey was for uh, examining the pollution exposure in indoor environments. The background is looking into uh, people being in residence, res residential indoor environments. Yes, everything in the background is how much time people spend there. And of course, the rest of it has significant components indoors. So indoor environments are a, a significant part of our lives. And of course, after COVID pandemic, we've experienced that more and more. So uh, the talk here focuses on indoor environments and a specific aspect of indoor environments. Uh, so we have looked into modalities of human building interaction, specifically when it comes to control of HVAC systems or, or thermal conditioning systems. These modalities basically have been uh, explored across around 400 publications that uh, we looked at. And we created a taxonomy for, for categorizing these studies into uh, into two major modalities of occupancy based or comfort based. And of course, the parameters of interest that we could use to measure some, uh, you know, variables that give us some information or help us infer uh, states of occupancy or state of comfort uh, has been presented in this graph. It's, it's the summary of, of a study that is, that is a very comprehensive study here is the study, if you're interested to look at it, it's a um, paper in the applied energy. And it talks about different dimensions, how effective these technologies are in, in quantifying um, the, this information around humans in these indoor environments. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the comfort as it's a complex uh, phenomenon. It depends, it, it basically relies or, or is, is dependent on physical conditions, psychological conditions, physiological conditions. So it's a very interesting uh, parameter to measure and control in the building, uh, in, in indoor environments. So to do that, I'm looking at two, two, three cases. I, I present three cases to talk about different dimensions of, uh, of human computer interaction uh, in, this, in this effort. So the first one talks about human experience integration. So you might have seen this. People are using personal thermal conditioning systems like a portable uh, you know, um, a heater under the desk. It's normal. Sometimes it's very cold. Your building might not uh, reflect what you're looking for. So you, you might uh, need to use this. This is interesting to see, to see, but the interesting observation in this specific image is that it, it was taken in California in the summer. So this is where almost all year we are cooling down the buildings, yes? So the cooling down is to an extent that people have to use these systems to satisfy their, their 
you know, thermal comfort needs because they're not comfortable. So they are, it affects their productivity, it affects the energy consumption and the sustainability of the system. So we looked at that image and then we started looking into a data-driven understanding of the problem. We collected surveys across fall and, and summer and you can look at this. We asked people how they feel, if they're feeling cold, cool, uh, cool neutral, warm, and hot. And then of course, 60% uh, of people in the fall, they said they are feeling cold and cool. I remember in California still, we, we cool down buildings even during the fall. And then in the summer, the same was observed. So, and we are spending almost 43% of energy consumption. So we are making people uncomfortable they're using a lot of energy. So there's a problem here. So what is the problem? This problem is not specific to California. It's been observed uh, across the board. Uh, the standards basically say that people, uh, buildings or HVAC systems and buildings should keep people, um, you know, more than 80% of the occupants satisfied. And a study on a lot of buildings in the US, Canada and Finland show that only 11% of the buildings are capable of, uh, of reaching that goal. So we were curious what the problem is. So here's the control logic. We have a control unit in the building, which is called a thermal zone. And this control unit is usually communicating with the environment through one sensor. I call it a single degree freedom communication. So I have one point, a set point that I adjust in here. And how do we identify this set point? There has been studies on these. In 1970s, Professor Fanger, a famous professor in this field, has developed a model with use basically with a true and experimental study on several thousand people, measuring their um, you know sensation about the environment, different physiological, physical variables, and of course the ambient condition in the room. And he came up with a brilliant model that is called PMD PPD, and that model basically reflects given a specific thermal condition in the building and generic. Uh, human related variables, for example, the clothing level, the metabolic rate, what, what is the group satisfaction in a building? So at the time, and of course, it's always the rule in engineering that we want to generalize as much as possible. It was a brilliant idea because it helped to create a, a very good, very robust uh, uh, engineering solution for thermal conditioning in buildings. But the problem started showing up because a lot of studies started showing that PM is not reflecting what people perceive in the building. But now we have a solution. We have capabilities to address this because of the IoT technologies and distributed computing systems. So we started thinking, how can we reflect this more realistic representation of people's per perception into the system? So we thought about a system uh, to be participatory sensing-based approach, and we wanted this to be to integrate preferences of occupants in the building. We wanted this to be uh, adoptable by existing buildings uh, and then minimally intrusive. So we came up with a framework and this framework had three components. These components include thermal preference sensing interface. So we looked at creating an interface that, help people, that helps people communicate what they, what they need in the building. And of course, we wanted to make sure that we learn. We don't want to keep doing this over and over again. We want to learn from individuals and of course reflect that, that into the building uh, control environment. So we called this framework HBITC or Human Building Interaction for Thermal Comfort. So the, the core component of this, uh, this framework, we had this app that we developed, we call it Ambient Factors. Um, I developed a, an Android version of the app. And of course uh, we developed, uh, you know, iPhone based as well, but uh, the interface is simple and there's a reason behind it. We started looking into observations from people uh, giving feedback. And one thing that we observed is that people can, do not give consistent comfort feedback when it comes to similar thermal conditions in buildings. For example, we have the exact same, the exact same uh, temperature and humidity and people give different um, uh, thermal comfort uh, perceptions or sensations. 
One reason is potentially when people have control, they want to make it perfect, yes? Or potentially there are other factors that are playing a role and uh, we're not accounting for. But what we wanted to do, we wanted to make sure that this system that they're developing is getting the most consistent robust data for training the, the HVAC system. So we learned from the scales that are available in the literature and we designed a human computer interaction study to find out what is the best way to represent this, this simple slider that gives us, um, you know, that, that help us measure the, the vote from people. And uh, I'm going to uh, avoid the details of these uh, designs, but we came up with a few designs, uh, but the nuances between these designs is whether we have snapping sliders versus, uh, you know, sliders that can move easily or, uh, pre presenting data, num numeric numbers, um, or keeping a memory. So these are some of the nuances in the design and we use some um, you know, famous uh, HCI usability studies uh, to, to measure the capabilities of these platforms and came up with a slider that, is, uh, that gives us the most consistent results out of every uh, data collection measurements. It was based on a survey that we collected data and, and uh, you know, statistically we found that to be effective. But as you see, this is a simple slider doesn't have any data on it, any numeric values. And there is a, the, the reason is because it helps people give more consistent votes. but we wanted to control buildings based on that. We augmented this with with a with a sensor systems in every room. So this is a box that we created. We called it ugly black boxes because they were super ugly and everybody hated us for putting these in their offices. Uh, but the thing that the, 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 these systems helped us uh, create a learning framework behind us. So in reality, this, this, um, this slider is a smart slider in the sense that when, as people interact with it, it learns their preferences and adapts to it. So we added a fuzzy pattern recognition algorithm for that. And then this is the outcome of this. So for example, this individual users, uh, this, this, this individual provided data and we adapted when we learned a multilinear uh, you know, model for this slider. So they have sensitivity to, to, to cold weather and they are less sensitive to warmer weather. So we could potentially use this information to increase temperature without uh, you know, violating their preferences. So that was an interesting component and we use that, we combine this into a more complex framework uh, with a server that was controlling a building uh, and we controlled part of this building for three months. Uh, this was uh, a building that people use this system and then uh, we measured the performance of the building. Uh, in a very high level description of the performance. Uh, this graph basically shows how people perceive before and after using this system. This is their comfort and we had uh, considerable improvements. I don't use the word significant because we did not run any statistical analysis for it. And of course, a very interesting outcome of that was we managed to reduce this the energy consumption uh, by 25%. So here I'm showing 39% because we are using airflow reduction uh, into the system, which is linearly correlated with the energy consumption. Very interesting, but of course, uh, we wanted to go beyond that. The reason is because I don't want to keep asking people. Yes, keep asking people, make them, you know, bored with the system. They are, they feel that they, this is something that is bothering them. It, yes, they can, they have control, but at the same time, they don't want to keep providing information to the system. So uh, one other thing is that we learn those preferences, but still we are communicating through that single degree of freedom, yes? So we improve TC quantification. We, we are learning their pre preferences. We pass that information. And still we are measuring at that single point because we're communicating that information to the central thermostat. So we started thinking, can we actually come up with a more distributed sensing approach? And we came up with this idea of human sensors. So we wanted to see whether we could turn human body into sensors using the uh, 
concept of distributed control, uh, the concept of distributed control basically leverages the idea of ubiquitous computing devices that we have. We are using smartwatches. We have camera into our face every day. So in this case, I'm presenting a case of using uh, webcams for measuring thermal comfort. Um, so uh, we thought about basically leveraging of this data that is constantly transmitted, um, uh, could be transmitted. There are privacy concerns around this, but there are other modalities of measurement of physiological responses of human body that could potentially solve that or potentially edge computing. But the idea was, can we start using the uh, webcams measure comfort at least at certain times of the day when the users are aware of that, and then integrate that information into the control of the billing system. To, for that, we actually relied on the concept that is used in, in medical domain and the idea beyond thermoregulation. So thermoregulation basically mainly works based on the flow of blood to the surface of the skin. So it's when it's hot, the flow of the blood increases, and then when it's cold, it decreases, it's called uh, vasodilation, vasoconstriction. And this helps us uh, dissipate heat with the environment and uh, regulate this, the core body temperature. So we wanted to see whether we could leverage that. We've, we've been inspired by this study out of MID, looking at the image magnification and measuring blood flow variation into the, into the face. We said, okay, if, if that's something that we could measure, we could potentially leverage that. So we started thinking about developing a framework. We conducted a study, collected data, and these designed these, this framework of collecting data using face recognition, isolating skin, and then looking into specific uh, index uh, of, of measuring blood variations uh, under different you know, uh, color, systems or uh, color ch different channels of representation of the RGB images. And uh, we came up with this framework to measure from a histogram uh, between two different temperatures. We originally tested it across two distinct temperatures of 20 versus 30 degrees. And we saw uh, promising results that we could detect increased blood flow versus decreased blood flow. But of course, it's in real world, we're not sitting in two, these two extreme temperatures, yes, 20 versus 30. So we are looking into uh, a transition. So we want to you know, account for this transition. And we started looking into more complex algorithms. And one of the major challenges that we observe when we go for transient temperatures, the motion artifacts, uh, even subtle motion artifacts that people move their head, even they're not aware of it, it causes a lot of error in the system. So we designed a, an adaptive filtering algorithm uh, to make sure that we isolate the high quality signal out of the signal that we are capturing and we're removing the artifacts. This, this is also coming from the domain of you know, medical um, measurements. So they, in, you, you've seen these uh, oximeters that people are very interested in these days because of the oh, blood oxygen level. Those devices usually have an accelerometer. So they measure motion artifacts and they subtract those motion artifacts from the signals to give, to give high quality results. When you're sitting in front of a camera, you don't have that. So we use the combination of independent component analysis and adaptive filtering to clear the signals. And the result was very promising. So we, co we conducted this uh, above uh, around 18 participants in the study. So people sat in, in transient temperatures from cool to warm for an, about, about an hour. And this is what we observed. So we could measure with, these, with this algorithm that temperature blood flow increases, yes? Or this index that we are measuring increases. And that was um, very interesting. So now we are having a system that helps us look into um, human body as a sensor and then communicating that information into the billing system. Of course, there are a lot of concerns here, potentially looking into the privacy and that by itself has a lot of human computer interaction dimensions into it that because of that, we are looking into other dimensions, other uh, modalities of sensing technologies, or looking into, as I mentioned, edge, com edge computing for avoiding potential 
problems with privacy concerns. So putting this into perspective, integrating human experience and then turning human body into sensors for distributed measurements across the environment. Now we are thinking about, so if we have this information, uh, can we start looking into um, smart home adaptation? So this, this specific case is looking into human robot interaction. So in that context, robot here is referring to smart speakers that are prevalent. So this graph shows the, the market penetration of the smart speakers and virtual assistants that go with them in the US market. And uh, this is around 90 million uh, users in the US, which, which gives us a lot of opportunities to leverage this platform and help people with, with a smart system that can manage their homes. The beauty of these systems is that they, they, they come with a they come with a smart home ecosystem. So this ecosystem connects with a lot of IoT enabled smart appliances, connects with the, with the cloud, and of course enables an easy communication channel. Yes, you can command the system. But we were thinking, can we just go beyond uh, just commanding? So we start making this smart speaker into something that communicates with people and then try to nudge them towards better behavior we have done a comprehensive study. Tianjie is, is, is the you know, force behind that study. He has done amazing, uh, an amazing study. It's a huge study that uh, is very interesting. But here I'm going to present a very small piece of it that is related to the thermal comfort that I presented above. So we want to see if we, if we could measure. Sure, it's, it's, it's going to be a couple minutes. So we want to see if we could measure comfort by simple questions and then see whether that affects people to accept a call from a smart speaker, for example, an Alex, Amazon Echo Alexa. So the question is, hey, would you let me set the thermostat higher to save energy? That's the type of question that we could ask. So we looked at, we collected data for across the nation using Qualtrics over 300 um, valid data points. And one thing that we measured is what is the range of people acceptance of temperature change? Yes. And then we try to look at different groups and testing hypothesis. Yes. So this shows the hypothesis evaluation for over 300 uh, cases. So in both cases, we had statistically significant difference between people that have larger acceptance to temperature changes versus, uh, uh, you know, smaller acceptances. The reason for the, the importance of this comes from the fact that we could actually add simple questions that is asked from the users and then enable a smart speaker to learn that and then communicate effectively rather than just frequently and blindly communicating with people. So by that, I'm going to wrap up the, the talk. We are looking into several other human building interaction factors, including one that is focused on COVID and how we could reduce, how we could measure exposure and how we could reduce the, 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 the exposure or mitigate the exposure. So I, again, I want to thank you uh, for, for the invitation and I wrap up uh, this and then acknowledge my, uh, the sponsors of, of the research that we've done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Farouk. Uh, what sure. a fascinating uh, study of, of how we can work in uh, in making spaces more comfortable and, and in helping uh, <clears throat> the computers and, and humans talk to one another. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for questions. Uh, I'll see if I can hit one that's quick. Um, sure. Uh, a question that we have is, is uh, um, ways are there ways that um, the system can adapt to the changing needs of individuals? So sometimes, like a sometimes people want a warmer or cooler environment. Yes. Even so, my perception of when I'm comfortable might be different from what my face, the color of my face, suggests. Any thoughts on that? So that's actually the, the color of the face is going to be trained by by your preferences. So we are we are going to basically train that with with the scale it or configure it or uh, doing that. But I think there's another important dimension into that. That uh, of course the human sensation is always part of it. But one thing that by learning from your face uh, helps us is we don't keep asking. We can basically go to a next season and you, we we can still use that that same information that we asked you. 
The other thing is, can we just change the, like, what is the fairness? Let's say if there are three people in this room and they are very different in their preferences, can we put them together in a fair way? And we've looked at that, we have designed algorithms around it. And of course, there are systems that we are developing to target the individuals in terms of delivering the conditioned air in the, in the, in the buildings. I didn't talk about those aspects, um, but that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank you for being here today. Uh, and sure. Thank you to the audience as well. Uh, if you have other questions, feel free to reach out. We're happy to connect you. Um, you. Next week, we have Reimagining Diversity. This is some uh, really great stuff that's happening on campus, um, exploring how technology and diversity uh, interact. So we'll look forward to seeing you next week and have a great weekend. Thank and you we'll so see you much. Then. Have a great day. Bye.